uh, University of Sydney, yeah. as well as a postgrad uh, develop diploma in a. Uh, in I got lost with. <laughs> Well, all the details that are there. In gynecology from Otago University. <laughs> she has been practicing. And in New Zealand, Maori as well. Now, when we look at intimate partner violence, we said it's, it's a pattern, it's a cohesive pattern of behavior. So what sort of tactics, you know, do people perpetrating this sort of behavior, what sort of tactics do they use? And mind you, they might not be aware of the tactics that they're using, they don't necessarily go to school to learn about which tactics to use. But these are the tactics that will actually be in play. The tactics like cohesion, you know, trying to manipulate somebody to do something. Straight out threatening somebody. Intimidation. Emotional and verbal abuse, words. Some say words are like sand. You've got some sand in your hand. Once you spray it onto the ground, for you to go back and collect each little grain back into your hand is going to be an impossible task. Words. Humiliation, guilting, shaming. It's not you, it's not your fault. These are tactics that can be used sometimes. Gaslighting and mind games. Now gaslighting is a particularly interesting one. It's where someone has a cohesive pattern of behavior to the point where you start to question yourself if you're still sane or not. You, still, you start to say, I, I, I think I'm the one losing the plot. Yeah? yeah? You start to say, I, I, I think it, it must be me. They do something and then they pretend they didn't say it. Yeah. I, I didn't say it. They start using children as a bit of a tool, a bit of a strategy to get what they want. So these are some of the tactics um, that people who perpetrate intimate partner violence may use. It's important that we know what these tactics are so that when they happen, we can actually notice. These are the gadgets in your cockpit going flash, 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 flash. You need to see that light so that you can react. So what will happen generally with internet, uh, which in New Zealand is available for children who are aged um, from nine years old, so nine to 27, it is funded by the government for that group of people, so they can get that uh, vaccine. Um, for those that will be going to school, when they get to about year eight, between ages of 11 or 12, uh, they actually start having those, those vaccinations. Uh, for those that are younger than 14, they'll have just two doses. Those older than 15 will have three. And that's because the younger ones, the immune system is a bit more robust. So just with, with two, they can sort themselves out. The ones that are a bit older need a few, a few more doses. If you're over the age of 27, you still can get uh, the HPV vaccine, except that now it comes at a cost. So for public health reasons, it now comes at a cost. So if you're close to the age of, of 27, you haven't quite reached it yet, and you're putting it off, or maybe you might want to think about it because once you hit that, you know, that 27 mark, then it's going to be a bit of a pinch on your pocket. How 
Good question. So for the three doses, it's probably about five hundred dollars. <laughs> so it's a bit, it's a Why bit pricey. Is it not free? Sorry. Why is it not free? Why is it not free? Yeah. Um, so it's mostly with these matters are mostly public health and funding issues. Yeah. So in the younger age group, because this is the group that is likely has not come in contact with HPV because they're not sexually active or haven't had many sort of partners, yeah. it then makes sense to give um, that group of people and, all, and to get as many of them vaccinated. Once you get as many of them vaccinated, as they become older and go into the community and start having partners, it's unlikely that you've got that much HPV floating around because you've vaccinated the whole lot. The older group are people who have mostly probably come across HPV uh, and what is probably more useful with that group is, well, they can still get the, the vaccine, not a problem, but if they don't manage to get the vaccine, the screening is then really key for them okay. because we do that every three years and I remember I said it takes 10 years for this to develop. So between 0 and 10, you know, I've got lots of chances to screen and pick up changes, do some treatment and prevent the cancer. Right, so that was um, it for cervical cancer. Now I'll talk about the very last one. I hope everybody's still awake. Yes. yes. Okay, good, good, good. Stay with me, stay with me. Not much longer, not much longer. Right, so now I want to talk about the big menopause. <sighs> it's okay. If, if you're feeling a bit hot and flushed, just, it's okay. For those of us going through menopause, you'll know about the seven little dwarfs of menopause. Bitchy, itchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. <laughs> right, so um, while there are the seven little dwarfs of menopause, it's not all doom and gloom. As a matter of fact, it could actually be an opportunity for you to have some me time. Mm. Take note of that, we'll come back to it. So by definition, menos uh, means month or period, and pause means to stop. Um, so menopause is your last period. Uh, when we say perimenopause, we're talking about the onset of menopause symptoms right through to menopause and after, and this can last anything between four or eight years. Um, when we say women are postmenopausal, we're saying that they've, they've reached menopause and it has at least been 12 months or 48 months, or at least a year or two um, after that. If menopause is reached after the age of 50, it's a year after the period stops, you're postmenopausal. If it is reached just before the age of 50, it has to be two years and then you're postmenopausal. Off note, please, ladies, if you reach menopause, yeah, so your period stops, been a whole year, and then you have a bleed, it's not normal. Okay? No, your ovaries just haven't decided to wake up after 12 months to start doing the thing again. It's not normal. So that actually has to be investigated, Why is that? please. Sorry? Why is that? Why is it? Okay, so the biggest. Um, Concern with postmenopausal bleeding is endometrial cancer, mm -hmm. and so that is actually one sign that we see of endometrial cancer. So, when women have a bleed after menopause, we really need to investigate by taking a sample of the inside of the womb to make sure that it is not um, endometrial cancer that we're dealing with. So, as a matter of fact, if you do present to your GP with postmenopausal bleeding, you're referred on to gynecology services as a fast track. What fast track means is that they've got timelines, very strict timelines, must be seen within two weeks, must have a sample within X amount of weeks to exclude endometrial cancer. So just going back um, to menopause, um, some people will reach menopause before the age of 40. If that happens, that's um, premature menopause. Some will reach early menopause, so if you reach menopause between age 40 and 45, that's early menopause, but otherwise the average age of menopause is 51. Now, what happens around perimenopause, so the time, you know, around the, the menopause, you know, when the seven little dwarfs starts rearing their little heads. <laughs> so what's actually happening on a physiological level is that um, as women, when we're born, we've gotten 
infinite number, you know, an X number of eggs that we've got. Uh, and once we're born, we don't get any extra new ones. Once you get a bird, that's it. Yeah? And each month, you're firing one off, you're firing one off, you're firing one off. And so you just get to a point where there's none in the factory left. They're just all finished. But the ovaries, the two things sitting there where the eggs used to be, are desperately still trying to shoot out an egg. So they kind of go crazy with all the hormones, just trying to hopefully find one and just flush it out. So there's this whole flux of hormones that happens, um, and because of that and all the cycles that maybe, you know, it's trying and there's no egg coming, it create, generates all those, you know, responses and, and issues, all the vasomotor issues, the night sweats, the changes in your mood, being a bit forgetful, um, it's all changes and fluxes that are happening because of the hormones. You can also notice a bit of irregular bleeding, can become a bit heavy or a bit erratic towards the end of that time. Now, the symptoms, the common ones, the odd flashes, we all know about night sweats, aches in the body, so actual body aches, um, irritability, vaginal dryness, um, urine frequency, you just go to the toilet a bit more often. You can be quite irritable, your skin can start to dry out, um, loss of libido, and you can get disturbances in your sleep. So if you're around sort of that menopausal age and you see some of these things, you know, don't ignore it, it's something that's actually happening. Now the duration, like I said, can be anything lasting from anything between four or eight years or even two to eight years. Um, and if we look at 10 women, two out of 10 will have really severe symptoms that might take them all their way to their 60s. The majority of women say about six out of the 10 will have mild symptoms that might last the four to eight years. And two lucky ones will have nothing at all. They'll be like, menopause, don't know about it. Thank you very much. So, you know, you can, you can all, I'm crossing my fingers to be in the two, but I think I'm just gonna be either in the six or the other two. Um, now, a third of your life will actually be spent postmenopausal. Yeah? So here comes the me time. So it is actually probably a time to focus on you, on your physical health, on your mental health. We know things such as stopping smoking, exercising, eating well help with the menopause. And menopause by nature comes around that time when you've probably had the, the kids, the families complete, they've all started to sort themselves out. You have probably started to sort yourself out in terms of your career, you know what's going on and things like that. So you've done quite a lot and you know, you've come to a point where you could have a minute to sit down and have a look at yourself. Me time. So we can welcome the seven little dwarfs because they're coming with me time. Time to look at yourself, time to look at your mental health, and time to look at how much um, your, your health needs attention in terms of exercise and things like that. Now, in terms of uh, what to do with uh, menopause, like I said, eating well, quitting smoking if you smoke, regular exercise, um, incorporating relaxation techniques um, into your daily routine is a good thing. Um, for self-management, I was joking when I was doing this, like literally, carry a fan, yeah, <laughs> carry a fan, carry a little face spray, water face spray, dress in layers, so if you've got layers on, if you, you know, if you, if you start to feel hot, just take one at a time off, you start to feel cold again, back on it comes, yeah, um, and if, if you're getting lots of flashing, avoiding spicy food, avoiding caffeine, avoiding alcohol, that might make you have less hot flashes. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, the big question usually that I get is, what natural remedy can I use, doctor? <laughs> Truth is, there is not enough data for us to talk about any of the natural remedies that are actually available. So from a medical point of view, we cannot offer recommendation because there is not enough data, there is not enough evidence that any of them actually help. 
But having said that, if you've tried something and it's working for you, go for gold, keep going. If it's working for you, go for gold. But if you're on other medications, please check with your, with your doctor what medications you're taking because often a lot of the herbal supplements and things like that could um, activate the liver and other liver enzymes and affect you and affect the other medications that you're taking. So if you're taking other medications, just check with your doctor and say, look, I'm taking this and I want to take this. Some of them we know, like St. John's Wood, we're like, please don't. This is just going to mess everything up. Um, so just check with that. What we do have for evidence for is um, these non-hormonal things that we can use, so particularly to control the things like the hot flushes and all of that, these medications that we use, that we can use that are not actual hormones. Um, but what we definitely have the greatest evidence for and what we will talk about is um, menopause hormonal treatment. So it used to be called um, hormone replacement therapy. We now call it menopause hormone uh, replacement uh, treatment. And essentially what that is, is trying to give you back a little bit more of those hormones so that yours that are going everywhere gets a little bit stabilized. Now though, that um, uh, MHT is for control of the vasomotor thing. So it's not going to help really with, with like, you know, mood and things like that. For that we give other treatments like antidepressants if we need to talking therapies and things like that. But certainly if you're struggling, um, you can just see your GP and they can talk you through most of these. Hormone replacement therapy, I'll use the old term, um, is uh, quite safe um, if you look at it. Uh, some people will be worried about, you know, what happens with cancers and things like that, with strokes and with clots. Um, yes, while well, there is a, a small increase in risk, the, 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 risk, the increase in risk really, uh, risk versus benefit is really, really small particularly if we start that um, as close to menopause or as close to natural menopause as possible and provided you're under the age of 60, we're probably quite fine to keep going. So don't shy away from it if you need it. If you need it, go and get it um, and it could, it could really help you. So I think I'll, I'll stop here because I've been going on for forever um, and I will take uh, some questions from the floor. I thank you very much for being so attentive and for listening. Uh, to the speech, I hope I haven't bored people. <laughs> Thank you for a very informative talk. I just had a question about postmenopausal bleeding. Do you do you is the expectation that you bleed um, like a normal period or is it spotty? So postmenopausal bleeding is anything. You spot, you have an actual period. As gynae, uh, we want to know about it because we need to investigate that endometrium. And sometimes we'll actually interrogate other endometrium. So endometrium, sorry, is the lining of the womb. Um, so sometimes in some instances for women who are around or close to the age of menopause, we will have a lower threshold to go in and investigate. Um, so people who might have uh, a history of, uh, of endometrial cancer, diabetic women, um, and for women, and for women who are carrying a bit of weight on us. Now, the reason why we investigate for women who are carrying a bit of weight for or on us is because the layer, the fat layer we carry, actually makes estrogen. So the fat layer is actually generating more estrogen that is hitting your endometrium and make it overgrow. So when we say, oh, I'm going to have to check because I'm concerned, because you're on the heavier side, because you're diabetic, it is because I know on a physiological level, you are likely to be exposed to more endogenous estrogen, so more estrogen that you're actually making yourself that could be going to that endometrial lining and making it thicker. So in terms of postmenopausal bleeding, any spotting, any anything, you see look blood, please raise your hand and say investigate. Also, in the perimenopausal time, sometimes we investigate heavy bleeding that just doesn't seem right. It's never actually been there, and we're a bit concerned we will investigate that early, just so that we catch as much of this as possible and treat it early while we still can. Hi, uh, a question on the menopause side. You said um, you said it's the ovaries just going up and down. So in the event that you're having that, if you get your ovaries out, do you still get menopause or not? So um, 
getting the ovaries out is, is um, an oophorectomy, taking the ovaries out is like a, a surgical menopause. So for, if for any reason we actually have to remove the, um, the ovaries at surgical menopause, that will generate menopause. But we don't like to do that because while they're going haywire and maybe making some and maybe not making some estrogen, you actually still need the estrogen to protect your bones. Uh, and so you need that for bone protection, otherwise you just drive straight into osteoporosis, now we've got another problem, you fall over, you break your hip, now it's broken, and with a broken hip, even life expectancy goes down with broken hips. So we don't want you to have weak bones, and so we'll leave ovaries in place. Where we have to remove ovaries for surgical purposes, we'll try and conserve um, ovaries. So a lot of doctors talk about ovarian con conservation. For, is it possible for ladies under like, the age of 40 to get into early menopause? Yes. So it is possible for the ladies under the age of 40 to get into, into menopause, and we call that premature menopause. Um, and sometimes it's because of what we call ovarian insufficiency, uh, but we've got ways of checking and investigating that. So you find that um, usually we, we shouldn't be doing blood tests to check and see if you're in menopause. Uh, the only time we would rely on blood tests is in situations such as those, where someone uh, ahead of time appears to have gone into menopause, and so now we use blood tests to actually check and see if it has happened. So yes, it is possible. It doesn't happen very often, but it is possible. About um, if you, you decide not to take those medicine, like the, the patch and other tablets, what happens if you decide not to take anything at all? Nothing happens. You just go through menopause naturally. Um, so the idea of the, of the patches, the, the estrogen patches, is just to manage your symptoms. So some women will find it grossly intolerable, the sort of symptoms that they're getting with the menopause. It might make life in general really difficult for them. Um, and so they just want a bit more stability uh, about it. It will be a discussion between you and your GP about your goals of treatment. And similarly, every year, those goals are reviewed, looking at a plan to step down um, your, your hormone replacement and then eventually stop, depending on how far you've gone and how you're feeling. So you don't have to have it. It is more an offer to make life more bearable for you if you need it. I have a question uh, concerning the menopause. You mentioned people go to menopause at the, around 50 years and after one year if you see blood again that's an issue. So what happened if you start your menopause and then after three months you get blood again, stop, after four months comes, so it's irregular and you don't know how to control it. What advice can you give those people? So if you're getting irregular bleeding, it's probably still perimenopausal. So when the period then stops, if you say my period, I last had my period more than 12 months ago and you're over the age of 50, I will consider that you are postmenopausal. And so any form of bleeding after a complete stop of at least 12 months is postmenopausal bleeding. If there's breaks of three months and then something, you're still perimenopausal, so I might tolerate that because I expect a bit of erratic bleeding. But once it actually stops for 12 months, post that time, it is not normal to have a bleed. So if you're over 50, it's 12 months post that time. If you reach your menopause, say about 38, then I want at least two years post that time. Oh, and you just reminded me of one thing. Now, the ovaries, have, yes, they're shooting off, they're trying as much as possible to send off an egg. Sometimes they actually are successful. So contraception is actually still an issue during menopause, yeah? So um, if you reach menopause after the age of 50, you need to be on contraception for at least one whole year before you can stop and we think, think that you're safe. If you reach menopause before the age of 50, you need contraception for two whole years before you can stop because they can still fire off an egg. You can still have a late one. Fatima, did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any more nieces. One more question, please, if uh, there's a question in the audience. Um, there's some women who have expressed that um, the periods, um, I don't know if it's, they're in the menopausal period, but they're all over the place. 
It's like the periods are coming and they're going, coming and going. They're not regular, they're irregular. What does that mean? So that depends on the, the age um, of, the, of the person that we're talking about. Sorry? 45. 45. So, 40 plus. Yeah, so at 40 plus, it could be just part of our perimenopause, um, but probably best to sort of go in, see your GP, then they can have a good chat with you about exactly what has been happening, take a good history, good examination, good investigations, and then only after that can they actually offer you uh, a diagnosis about what's going on. So if you're worried at all about your health or what's happening, you go, you see your GP, you just explain to them exactly what's going on, and they'll help you work out what is actually happening. Don't ignore it. Don't just sit and go, oh, I think if it is enough for you to have a question or two in your own mind, stand up. Go and ask someone those questions. That's what they, they're sitting for. That's what I woke up in the morning to go do. I go there and sit and answer people's questions. Thank you very much, Rubimbo. I'm sure that was very informative. And you see. Well, uh, okay, you've got uh, one second. You've been talking about going to see the GP, which is fantastic if you can afford them. Is there any way where you can, because I'm just linking what you talked about, about COVID and intimate partner violence, where maybe if you're an immigrant, you said 99% of us meet that criteria. So where do I go if, A, I'm an immigrant, I cannot afford to see a GP, and um, I do have issues that I need to have checked out. Is there some way that women can go? Because I think I might not be the only one. Yes, there is. Um, let me just quickly. Right, so if you go to, so you can take note of this, www.ruok.org.nz. So it's www.ruok.org.nz. Through there, you can then see all the different parts or avenues that you can use. Things like women's refuge, counseling service, free or 800 numbers to call and talk to somebody. It's, it's, it's all there. So there are lots and lots and lots of services that are available um, where you can access something. And I think we also even have um, on, on the tables, there's little flyers there uh, about some counseling services that are available. So all, all of those are available within our community and we can get in and link into, into those things for, for some help. Thank you.